Hi everyone, it's James here from Production Expert. We are in deepest, darkest Los Angeles, and I'm joining an old friend, Bat Hawkins. Um, we are. Where are we exactly? I, We're uh, in Culver City, um, right up the street from Sony, uh, a little small neighborhood called Palms, which is right connected to Culver City. And we are in my home studio, uh, apartment studio. And uh, this is just a little pre-production kind of setup, writing room, uh, where I get a lot of sketches done and uh, work on little MIDI ideas and make noise. Noise is, is the trick. There's loads yeah. of toys. We'll talk about that as loads we go Loads of little through. toys, little cheap plasticky toys. and Toys of the way sense. forward. So, so what we first met at uh, Mix of the Masters in France. Yeah. Uh, great, I think we met stuff. over a beer, and then it was several beers. Several, yeah. And then it was a Neve console and several beers. Yes. Um, so we, we kind of come to the same sort of party, but from very different ends of the th ends of the, the spectrum. That's the one, yeah. yeah. Um, so you're, you're primarily a writer, aren't you? Yeah, I compose music. Um, I help a lot of uh, underdeveloped students and younger people with music learn how to record basics, uh, songwriting basics, MIDI basics. Um, recording stuff. Uh, I pitch music for TV and, and indie film. I can't say full film yet, working mm -hmm. towards that. Um, and then work on my own stuff as well. I love sound design, sound effects. I pretty much just try to do anything that has sound involved mm -hmm. to, to my, my knowledge and to my power. So yeah, I just pretty much love sound and go from there, yeah. But you've got a really cool kind of condensed, say not a yeah. little setup but in any yeah. stretch, but um, obviously, Keyboards is your focus. Yes, definitely. There's there's no kind of mixer or control surface or anything like that. We'll nope. talk about that later. Definitely. Um, but it's very much a keyboard centric kind of world. Yeah. There's some guitar amps and guitars and stuff. Yeah. But I get the feeling that, uh, things like the guitar effects and things like that more for sound design. Sound than design. For... Yeah. I mean, uh, at best, I'm a rhythm player with a few chords under my belt, and I just try to make the electric guitar sound like not an electric guitar and an acoustic sound like a a duck or something, anything, you know, <laughs> like. So yeah, just more of a ambient kind of stuff and noise as what I use the traditional instruments for, even pianos, so. Cool. So tell us a little bit, obviously you're a recording guy, but, yeah. but most of your kind of, um, for lack of a, for a dirty word, income comes from music for film and music. TV. Music for film and TV, And yeah. you've had a fairly successful um, license. Is it licensing, licensing yeah. or placement? Or? Licensing and placement, yeah, it's they're the same thing. I mean, they're... Placing, placing something is licensing something. Uh, yeah, I was, I was very fortunate to get involved with the uh, NCIS, the global TV show, global... A, li a little show. A little yeah. show, yeah. And back in 2003, uh, I was living in Seattle, and I, me and a couple of friends of ours, audio fans, and decided to start um, our studio, a little a production team, basically. And we called everyone, and we wrote everyone, and we bugged everyone. Squeaky wheel gets the grease. Mm -hmm. And um, that led to a few different contacts that connected us with another person. And we uh, ended up finding out about the show NCIS, which wasn't called NCIS at the time. And they mentioned they needed a, a piece of music. And the creative direction was techno with a happy heart. That was all they gave us. <laughs> and uh, I tell this to everyone. So. And so we went back to our little MIDI lab, and this was in 2003, Pro Tools 888 mm -hmm. IO, and yeah. uh, Yamaha 01 Vs, yep. two ch chained together, and a ton of keyboards, viruses, and JP8s, and, and that's how we wrote that. I mean, none of it, digital was not going back then, obviously, in 03. Mm -hmm. And so we you know, wrote that, sent it off to Hollywood from Seattle, Eight months later, they get a phone call saying, hey, you know, we like your song, and then we're gonna, we want to use it for a theme song. It's for this show called Naval Criminal Investigator Investigative Service. We're like, oh, that rolls that's, off the that's tongue. That's catchy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, several years later, they shortened it to NCIS, and uh, it turned out to be a hit. And, it and was it's probably one of the world's biggest TV One shows. of the biggest dramas, yeah. And Mark, Har Mark Harmon's the lead, and he's like a very famous actor and has a lot of history in Hollywood. And, mm -hmm. And uh, it was really just really luck, 100% luck that they chose us. The story goes, the music supervisor that we worked with, his boss, um, was walking by the room as they played, as he was demoing our song that we sent, the techno, the happy heart. Mm -hmm. And then he's, his ears perked up and did a you know U turn back into the office, and he's like, "I like that. Let's pitch that to the client, which is Belisario, Donna Belisario." And they liked it, and the rest is. Is, history, as they is say, history. yeah, and it's been syndicated now. It's in a lot of multiple countries. We're very lucky that they haven't changed it because they very well could have said, mm -hmm. "Oh, yeah. let's put a different one on." 
And um, yeah, and, and, and as, as far as residuals, you know, they're, they're really great res residuals. I am, I am a co-writer, so there's three of us. Mm -hmm. And learning that if you add up how much you make and then you times it by three, or that's how much you would make mm -hmm. minus the two other co-writers. Yeah. So that's basically a third of what it generates. So and as far as the residuals from that, it's a based on a... It's called a use weight. And a lot of royalties, a lot of people don't know this, it's similar to a stock. Because now, okay, so back up a little okay, bit. Yeah. Um, our system in the UK is very different, I okay. know that. But just whenever you use one of those terms, like a stock or something like that, if you could just go in and, and I hate you to always double click, but you yeah, know what I mean? Sure. Because there are so many terminologies here, and I think this is actually really important. Um, one of the reasons I thought, well, I had that moment of, hang on, this could be a really interesting chat. Yeah. Not only are we mates from doing Mix of the Masters, sure, sure. but also you come to it and your your revenue, your income stream is from a very different side of the industry yeah. to, to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's a lot of people out there who would love to be doing this sort of stuff. Yes, definitely. So so you, you get a, a, a track, a tune, uh, a mix placed. Place, yeah. What, what stage is that at? When you send off the demo, mm -hmm. is that at a rough mix level or is that the finished production? That was the finished production, um, what we sent to them. They kind of got locked to it mm -hmm. and it got ringing ring their heads so many times they got used to it. Yeah. Um, we weren't professional mixers at the time, so they have their guys go in and beef it up mm -hmm. and run it through their equipment. And um, so they'll effectively master it. They to master, a, it. master it. Master it. Yeah, I mean, we were three guys who were more of a mixing kind of composer based, and we hire mastering engineers and et cetera, et cetera. We can fake it as much as we can, but yeah. mastering is a it's a black art. That's the whole yeah, thing. yeah, definitely. But uh, yeah, and so. Um, yeah, we sent them that. They've had a, they had a couple of changes. The original track was 30 seconds long, and they needed to be a lot shorter, down to 13. So cutting parts, moving here, I mean, you're just editing the master track, basically, yeah. taking making it shorter and making it, they said, two minutes should start here, per their directions, edit around. That's when then we sent that back. This mm -hmm. is all through CD, you know, yeah. before the internet was really a tool for that. And I'm assuming that must have been very handy to have, to be yeah. in the center of, I didn't realize there were two studio districts in yeah. LA. Yeah. And uh, yesterday I, I thought I was at one and I was actually supposed to be at the other. Yeah. And then I ended up back over the other side of the valley. And anyway, la -di -la -di -la. Yeah, there's a um, lot, of, lot of studios. But you are really close to Yeah, I'm, to I'm Sony Sony's right there. It's just there. Hollywood's about uh, about a 15 minute drive away. And if you're lucky. If you're lucky, <laughs> yeah. If you're in the summertime, when there's no school, but uh, yeah, we're pretty pretty close to a lot of studios. The Village is a huge, amazing studio. The Village Recorders is in uh, West LA, which mm -hmm. is a 10 minute drive from here. It's on my list. <laughs> and yeah, please go. Oh my God, that is an experience when you go down the hallway. And you know, all the studios are closer. Some here in Culver. There's a lot of film productions going on here, a lot of post production suites, and a lot of different companies that are in the area. And I go and meet those people from time to time, mm -hmm. which is great to put a face to a name and just to say, hey, and look at their gear, kind of what you do, you know. Just... Presumably, it's great to press the flesh as well. Because yeah, you're definitely. Actually, you know, they're, they're meeting you. You're not, yeah. you're not random guy on the other side of the world. I don't live in my mom's basement and <laughs> somewhere in the middle of nowhere. No. I'd like to, but no. Um, yeah, it's great. To, that, that's good to live in LA for that. I, I, mean, I lived in Seattle when we, when we wrote this, and that wasn't necessarily known to be an entertainment hotbed. It's more or less of the artist. It's rainy, like the UK, rainy a lot. You end up honing in your craft, working indoors, because you can't run around outside as much. And... I like coming over here in January, because yeah. quite frankly, even when you guys are all saying, so cold, I'm still walking around in a shirt. Yeah, 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 <laughs> definitely. And, no, and yeah, no rain, which we've had a little bit of rain this year, which is good. But yeah, you know, being in Seattle, we were nobodies, basically, and this was our first strike out of the, of the bat. And... We had done a handful of video games, so we had like we kind of looked like a company, yeah. which we were really just three guys in a studio with, with a bunch some of gear with and, some gear and, and, a, and a dream. Yeah, like that's the most important thing. Yeah, and um, I was lucky that one of the guys we work with um, has uh, ten years older than me, and he had been in the game a little bit longer and had a lot more of a developed ear, um, and he was kind of the senior kind of composer, sound designer guy of our group. I was the middleman, and our other guy was more of a business. So we kind of hit mm -hmm. all those targets perfectly. We had someone handling the phones, someone handling a string part, someone handling a bass line. I mean, we, we, we were a someone shot. looking after the accounts. And, yeah, looking yeah. after the accounts. And, and, and anyone who says that's not important, 
<laughs> yeah, they don't know <laughs> they, the site. They normally go out of business as well. Yeah, and they, they don't make a lot of money <laughs> yeah. or any money. But yeah, no, it was great. A great, great experience. So we're very lucky. You know, we've received 13 ASCAP awards from it and um, under the category of most performed themes, which is based on ratings and, mm. you know, how much the show airs and where it airs and how much money that ASCAP makes. And So... So to circle back sure. a little bit. I'll run around. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all right. I'm just the same. So the, 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 your, your track gets picked up. Yeah. They say, we want to license it for uh, an amount of time, or mm -hmm. they say, we want to license it for as long as this show runs, or, as, what, lo or as long as we choose to run it for. Yeah, that, our, that was in our contract. Uh, it, the funniest part is that the song covers the universe. Right. So in case 100 years we colonize Mars and the song plays there, still the same contract right so un a universal contract and it was for the length of the whole show now that being said other shows have had themes in and out and they have different situations but ours we're lucky that it's still the same one and we're holding on strong so. yeah yeah so so what's 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 the process in the states of actually um so you see it air you hear, hear it air for the first time you think woohoo yeah. cha ching cha ching um, rich, yeah yeah I suspect it's not that simple, right? Mm -mm, not that simple And you, there are several hoops and things you have to jump through. Basically, and... yeah. So basically what you do is you get a synchronization fee up front. That's your upfront fee for them to sync your music to picture. There's mm -hmm. a fee for that legally, government-bodied uh, law that you have to do. So we got our fee for that. Um, it was a decent amount of chunk, just a, a small compared mm -hmm. to the grand scheme of things. And the show airs, years go by, peanuts, you know, nothing, not, not a ton of money, you know, not a lot of uh, revenue. The show gets popular. Mm -hmm. That's when you start getting a little bit more, your royalty rates and stuff like that generate a more income for you because the more popular the show is, the more that the that royalties are worth, basically. It's, a, it's called a use weight. Right. The usage of your song has a weight, how heavy or light it is. And that's determined how the show's a hit. And there's a lot of factors that are involved with that. Is it prime time? Is it a major network? There's several different factors. Those are just two of the major that I, I usually talk about. And it was on a major network, CBS, mm -hmm. and it was a prime time, seven o'clock, uh, eight o'clock in the West. And it became a hit. And so once that happens, it, they get you know more advertising money and more uh, more money from the studio, more actors, better actors, better mm -hmm. music, better. And of course, it then it sp uh, spirals, spirals up. up with yeah, you. and it spirals up. And I don't. I'm sure it's different for a lot of different shows. And nowadays, 2016 versus 2003 might be completely different. I haven't had a theme song in a show since then. Mm -hmm. So, um, as my buddy says, you can't beat number one. So I'm stuck sticking to that. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. So and so many years go by, and really, no, not very much money at all. I mean, the royalties were really low. I, I would never consider living off of royalties. Um, and then just in the past, maybe four or five years since syndication, and since you know it, they call it the back end. Mm -hmm. Now I'm in the back end of all these shows that have been aired. So what, I was in the current front end, mm -hmm. which means you're not getting all of these shows airing all over the world airing um, marathons here in America and yeah. like that stuff hadn't happened I, I, yet. I, I think um, NCIS is probably on in the UK every waking hour Thank at you, some point. UK. So, um, so you, you still, you see, even though it's, you're, you're in the States and it was an American deal, it, it, yeah. you still see from China and Japan yeah, and from the UK. Definitely. From... I mean, obviously the, the bigger countries pay more. Mm -hmm. I mean, your Australia's, your UK, your Canada, your France and Germany and Smaller countries, maybe maybe not so much Morocco. I mean, not that it matters, but it's like it's just a, a good variation of uh, global powers, kind mm -hmm. of. You know, which country is more successful? So, does that mean you have to join the the performing? We have the PRS Performing sure. Arts Society. In the so, do you have to join all of them, or do ASCAP look after you for all of? ASCAP them? will go and track down all of your international money and domestic money that, right. that you're owed, and. There are several other companies that you can join, aggregator companies. Um, I'll drop TuneCore's name mm -hmm. that they say they go out and find stuff that maybe your PRS, PRO missed. Mm -hmm. And so, so I'm- PRO? There's two, rights. Performance Rights Organization, mm -hmm. and then there's Performance Rights Society. Right. Organizations, corporate, societies more by the people. ASCAP's, right. ASCAP and BMI, the two guys in America uh, that are pretty big. Uh, BMI is a more of a corporate, and ASCAP was is run by all the members. So right. 
the members don't make any money, the company goes out of business. They've been around 100 plus years, so they're mm -hmm. doing pretty good. Whereas BMI has corporations to fall back on, Sony and all the major. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of the difference between the two. I don't know if one pays more than the other. That's a golden question I get asked all the time of whether or not if I were to be on BMI, would my royalty rate be more or would I make more? It's an unknown thing. I love ASCAP. They have been great to me and they're like my family and they... They're really good. They check all your royalties and statements are online and they have events and they have tons of educational stuff. Look, understanding the royalty thing is really complicated, like very complicated. I'm hardly scratching the surface on probably the real story of it. Mm -hmm. I'm just explaining on what happened in my end. But that, not that, but that being said, you can go to their website, you can go to their events and just absorb all of that. Mm -hmm. And like, I have, like I've done, I still go to the events and I'm still learning all the time. And um, you know, with that being said, they, I'm sure BMI does too, but ASCAP's who I'm with and they're, they're very open and honest about mm -hmm. where your tracks are being played and how much you're getting in the raid and they're just, it's, it's so much detail. Cause this, this came up cause we've just had the conversation. I've done a couple of drum tracks for Matt and you yeah. just said that yeah. a couple, one of them's getting picked up. Yeah. So, you know, where do you want your royalties sent? I was like, uh, I don't yeah. know because quite frankly, most of the clients that I work with, and this is no offense to any of them, I have always said I will take a flat fee. Yeah. But, and I, I will probably kick myself in the face if one of your tracks that I'm playing on gets picked up and goes number one or goes viral yeah. or whatever. But at the moment, most of, the, most of my clients, the chances are that that's not going to happen. Yeah. So I've never, I've never bothered. Yeah. Um, which is probably really bad. Well, to, to, your, to what you're saying, um, you can't really necessarily join a lot of these societies until you have something published and picked up. Mm -hmm. That was the deal with us. We weren't on ASCAP before we got the theme song. The theme song got us into ASCAP. Right. Now we have a number and there's what's known as cue sheets. And mm -hmm. those are what the, the CBS, for example, will send to ASCAP and back they go back back and forth to show you when, when it played, what network, how much it's worth, the use weight. Mm -hmm. We just talked about the royalty rate, yada, yada, yada. And then that's how they determine, you know, how um, how they how they pay you basically. And so getting in there, almost have, you have to have one a gig to get in there. Mm -hmm. So that's why with me, I do this for a lot of my friends. If I can, I try to get them on a, a society. So for example, I, I write some background music and start source music for NCIS for one mm -hmm. of the particular characters. Maybe I'll have a friend come in and play a key part. Mm -hmm. And they're a struggling musician. They don't know anything about the business or industry. And I'll be able to get them a credit on it. And they'll now be able to go and sign up with ASCAP or BMI or whoever they choose because they have a small little part and a mm -hmm. thing and that I've done for a show. It has a number on a cue sheet. So now they're in the system. Right. So for our deal, you know, what I'd like to do and, and whatever one you choose to sign up with, if, if everything goes as planned, um, for our, our, our spot that we're working on is that once I get a number for you, then you have that information, job, job number, job title, job description to go and report that to your, the PRS of your choice. Yep. And then they go, oh yeah, James Ivy, and they create an account for you, then that starts the and collecting. That, and then theoretically that just happens automatically. I just tell them the next job that comes in either from you or another client. Yeah. Says, through the cue sheet. Right. And that's that's how it's submitted. I mean, it might be different when in England. I just know kind of the mm. US stuff. I'm, yeah. I haven't scratched that surface. But but yeah, so I mean, getting on a PRO, a PRS is is how you make get your royalties. And they're the ones who cut the check for certain deals that I've dealt with. Now there are different deals with the record labels and with different production companies than the film companies that they can pay you the royalty directly. So my way is not the only way that I'm, I'm describing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to make sure you know that. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And obviously, depending on where you are in the world, yeah. it can all be very different. Totally different. But say, from, from I know most of our readership it is based in the US, yeah. so it kind of makes sense to yeah, tell yeah. the American story. Definitely. Uh, we'll probably try and find someone in the UK or Europe who can tell that yeah. side of the story totally. as well. Um, so let's steer it back to familiar territory. Yeah. Toys. Toys, Toys. And yeah. So I like I have a basic setup. You know, I uh, <coughs> write stuff with a, a MIDI keyboard. I record with an interface. So you're um, running Logic, Logic and, Ten, and Pro Tools. Yep, Logic and Pro Tools. I'm still that guy. Mm -hmm. um, I have I I love all DAWs. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's they're all pretty much the same. I know they have different functions and. Yep. 
Um, I mean, I, I, when I started out, digital wasn't the best. We had tape and mm -hmm. four track recorders. So I think it's a huge step up from a four track yeah. four. So and that's another topic. Yeah, I use Logic um, with uh, uh, Antelope Audio, Orion Studio. Yep, yep. I, I'm very much in approval of them at the minute. You very much got me <laughs> to pull the trigger between that and a few other boxes. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you gave it an Editor's Choice Award, that was pretty much the icing on the cake for me. And I love how they have you know the FPGA effects mm -hmm. that simulates a lot of our favorite EQs. and They are really good. I mean, I was so surprised. a lot of people say to me, are they as good, and let's face it, it comes down to, are they as good as UA, as Universal Audio? Yeah, then that's a different beast. I, like. I think they sound good as standalone effects. Yeah. I think if you were to say, does the SSL EQ, for example, it's not called SSL, it's called something else, and I can't yeah. remember what it is, but does it sound like an SSL EQ? No, yeah. it sounds SSL-ish, sure. but I don't think it sounds like an SSL EQ. Mm, no. Whereas the UA models of stuff, people with significantly better ears than mm -hmm. me have yeah. said this sounds Identical. like the real yeah, thing. Yeah, I've heard that. Um, that's not to say the, the effects in the, the Antelope stuff aren't completely usable, yeah. they are. And actually, I think the reverb's really good. Yeah, that, the R reverb's great. Yeah, um, sounds, sounds really nice. Um, and as someone who, oh, I, I still can't believe I actually bought a Bricasti um, in a moment. Oh, of, those are beautiful pieces. But, of and it is, there is something about it, but do you know, all reverb sounds pretty damn yeah. crystally, shiny. Yeah. Um, it doesn't sound too thin, it has a little thickness. It's not a Bricasti. But it's 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 all over, mm. you know, and that's what that's kind of what I'm getting at is everything kind of has its own mm. thing, and you just use which ones you like. I really. like I love the fact that you've got some gear in here, so like that little SK1 yeah. Casio is yeah. um, probably the sort of thing we all have when we're about two ten. years old. Yeah, that's yeah. what you learn but music on, and it's got a sound. Yeah, it does, and you know, for the most part, that if I'm just quickly wanted to pull up a, a melody thing. I don't have to pull up a MIDI instrument or, mm -hmm. or grab a piano. This is dee 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 dee. And yeah. you know, sometimes I run it through a bunch of guitar pedals and make yeah. it sound crazy, not a Casio. And it's uh, when my little nephews come over, you know, they yeah. play it too. So. And these things, I'm seeing a lot of these in yeah, studios. Yeah, and these are, these are good. The little Korg. The Korg um, Volca Synths, it's, um, it's their new semi-analog sounding stuff. I use it as more of a like a toy kind of. I trash it up and I make it sound like not a chord at all. So yeah. that's that's there and it's more of just kind of to get an idea. I can make a quick little beat and to practice guitar or just just for rhythm ideas. Now the bass sounds pretty good and the uh, synth thing is weird and wonky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's that's you know it's a toy basically to me and synthesizers and keyboards are. I love, I like, I'm not a synth collector. I've had a lot and I've gotten rid of a lot from Moog, from Junos, from everything. I've had a cup of coffee spill on a Voyager before. Oh, and uh, that so was, that's, that was expensive. That make, yeah, <laughs> and that makes you kind of go back to the cheaper toys as you see here. Yeah. So yeah. Um, but I love the fact you've got a, a Mark II DX7. Yeah, DX7 with um, a Line 6 delay. You know, one note with a bunch of effects. And it, it works. It because sounds great. For sound design stuff, yeah. some of that can be the right sound. Yeah, and to be honest with you, nothing cuts more than a DX7 digital yeah. synth. Like, yeah. this is the, the most cuttingest, if that's a word, cuttingest digital synth I've ever, I mean, I still keep it around for that. And just that sort of FM8 bass sound. FM8, that, the bass. Um, and going in and making your own algorithms of just the craziest, weirdest thing. Mm. I mean, it is a little complicated. It's like pushing a calculator, but maybe I kind of like calculators, so. And uh, yeah, you know, we all love our old, the Moogs and our analog stuff and modular, and I'd love to have a wall of that. I just would get so lost. Mm. With this stuff, I can get a crappy sound and I like yeah, it. Yeah, so. and you can mess around with it and, and hack it up and. Yeah. So down here, what we got? That's, so my, my probably my favorite thing in the whole world, the 11 rack. Yeah, just definitely avid home run. Yeah, that was a great purchase for me, and I I've had it for a couple of years. I don't think I've used it to its full potential. That I mean, I'm sure you can go for days. Um, yeah, I play, I've lost myself. For, yeah, you really can. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's been a great addition for guitar stuff. Like I said, I do more noise guitar, and if I have someone who can play a lead or something, I'll run them through that, let them pick their own tones out, and. Um, not very often. I just use that kind of more for like the distortion and the mm -hmm. amp simulation, basically. Yeah. 
And then you've got the Personas. Yeah, the Central Spe Station. Yeah. Now that, um, I don't really know much about it besides it's passive. And I, I've heard that that's sometimes good and bad. Uh, all I know is I just, I like the switching. I yep. like the speaker switching. Um, I don't think it's coloring my sound that much. I've heard that it's crap and it, it is coloring. I know lots of people use it. Yeah, I've seen them in a lot of studios, yep. so I haven't switched. I know there's the Grace that's great and uh, the obviously the Avocet is yep. great. And one day maybe I'll make yeah. the change, but why break what's not fixed? I've heard a lot of people say things, things along the line of you, can, you could upgrade every single part, bit of your path yeah. from the microphone to the speakers yeah. and everything in between. But how many of those, if your clients don't notice, mm -hmm. is it much? Now, you, you're talking to the world, probably one of the world's biggest gearheads. Yeah. Um, certainly one of the world's biggest online gearheads. Yeah. Um, and for me, I've, I've always wanted to get my, my everything up to the next level. Yeah. Hence the console, the Procasti, yeah. and the small. All very needed. The, probably not. Uh, uh, if, I'm, your head. <laughs> if I'm totally honest, I, I could probably still work quite happily with a little interface. Yeah. And I feel the same way. And a mic, some mics, a box of mics, yeah. and a drum kit. Mm -hmm. But would I have as much fun doing it? That's, you know. That's... And would in my head my product be as good as it, as it is? That's the golden question. And there's nothing, and I, I think of all people as well, Russ actually said this yeah. when, I, when I was sort of, we were talking about buying the console. And I think I've probably been talking about this for well over a year. Sure. Um, there's nothing wrong with just wanting something. Yeah. Oh my gosh. No, I mean, it's paint. It's different types of paint and color yeah. and salt and pepper. And what do you like? You know, yeah. that's what I But look to the at point it. where I know we were chatting earlier about, and you are also thinking about the whole going the console. Yeah, route. definitely. Um, I, I want the tactile faders. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I love studios, major studios, recording studios. I, I don't want them to go out of business. Mm. I would rather put money into my projects there than maybe spending all my money on a giant console. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I love consoles, and I, I am. I've been talking to you about a few different options, and uh, well, it turns out we were probably looking at the same same few ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and you know, and the, the the thing with the faders is great. I mean, you, like we were just talking earlier about how you've had a massive, huge change in your clarity and your sonics mm. because of this console yeah and your hands are on it that's the number one thing like i'm a composer i love my i love touching things mm. and and playing little knobs and i i think I, and then in the in the screen is fine in the daw mm. that's fine too i just you know i like to make noises and with the with the console i can see myself kind of stripping down a lot of those mm -hmm. techniques you would use on on your daw and then using it just this compact piece mm. of metal you know and in like, running your faders up and down that, that that's what i'm looking for in the next couple of months so i think i think a lot of that for me certainly stems back to that week in france it yeah. sounds like some kind of romantic getaway doesn't it but uh, yeah that it was i think i learned more about audio that week than i learned right probably at, on my three-year degree course and yeah i mean like for me i've been focusing on what does it sound like Musically, mm. not quality. I've been focusing on key signatures and notes and 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 scents and stuff, and not really giving much thought to my clarity and my mix. And then when we went to France, learning that I, all the stuff I thought made a good mix was all wrong. Yeah. And then working with the fabulous Al Schmidt, that was just watching him work, kind of opened my uh, third eye and just said, hey, you know, you need to change your approach. And that's what I really gained from Mix with the Masters. And I'm so glad I went. I would mm. go in a heartbeat. So yeah. I recommend that to anyone who's I've, there. I've said very similar things, yeah. uh, probably on podcasts and interviews and stuff ever since. It Definitely. was it was a chunk of change. Yeah, it was an investment. But yeah, I, I think that's the way you... And I think anyone who looks at education where they're thinking, do you know what, I, I should go to SAE or um, Full Sail or whatever... Yeah. <sighs> I would almost say, save your money. Yeah. And go and do. Yeah, if that's how you learn, if yeah. you learn hands on watching someone, maybe people learn from a book better than they learn from watching an, a legend like Al Schmidt mm. mix um, and pull up his sessions. I mean, schools are great, learning on your own is great. Uh, and there are plenty of websites and websites, stuff with videos and things. And can't now, think of any yeah, of I can't think of any. <laughs> no, and then nowadays, you know, with YouTube, nowadays, I'm only 38, but listen. Yeah. Um, nowadays, with you, have, you can learn everything from a computer. And, and 
but you got to be careful. It's there's some opinion based out there, and there's a lot of professionals that are endorsed. And I mean, it's just like a school. Do you want to trust a teacher's opinion? You just you could take it all for granted. Yeah. That's what yeah. I'm saying. I, I think certainly when we, we've chatted and stuff about other mix of the masters we'd like to yeah. do. Um, the Andrew Sheps one comes up a lot. Oh yeah, that was, that's one on the menu. Because of his whole theories on parallel processing mm -hmm. and EQ and... And in the box. And yeah, the... And, and and yet now he's moved back to Wales. Yeah. He's it's now so got a huge API console. Oh, looks and, great. And I'm like, yeah, need to get in there. Yeah. Um, but the other one for me is um, Chad Blake. Yeah. For the whole distortion, saturation. Yeah. Making it sound and say the whole making it sound gritty and making yeah. it sound nasty and, and using the good grit, yeah, yeah, and and knowing what what is good and what is bad grit, yeah, um, and the whole I mean, fix it in the mic. That that's like was the best thing I, I learned from there. I mean, yeah, sure, it's great if you have a Neve and you have a sixty seven and the best outboard gear. That's great, but not everyone has that, and no. so and how much did we use? Uh, okay, we put probably pulled up. The one Portek EQ mm -hmm. for the vocal. The 33609. Oh, yeah, of which I'll use. Half a dB. Yeah, like. and I, I, I remember on, on the EQ, I think it was uh, Robo who said, can we just have one more click of yeah. top end? Yeah. And I was like. On the 1073? On, on, on the one of the Portek, yeah, just, yeah. just oh, to yeah, get the, the top yeah. end on the vocal. Uh, and I was like, we've, we've got all this gear and we're using none of it. <laughs> There's no EQ in anything. Yeah. There's no nothing. It's yeah. just great. Mic placement. placement and and yet the vocal just jumps yeah. out at you and you go, yeah what is that what is that yeah. secret sauce that's the magic you know that's uh, that's years of experience knowing rooms uh, knowing mics knowing singers knowing different ranges it's not just gear you know mm. to me it's 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 brain and ear and Alschmidt has all of that times a million so yeah. If I I just wanted to breathe the same Dang, air, not it. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to breathe the same air as Al, and we happen to be in France, and that mixed with the master's course. If you love gear, it's like a gear vacation. Mm. You know, you eat great food, you meet great, you meet buddies, and you talk about audio the whole time, and then you get to. Rec it's just, a, it's just. A, I mean, I get goosebumps because yeah. I, I, I like. It, it I really was... enjoyed it. Like, really enjoyed it. Uh, are we on a back end, backhander from Mix of the Masters for this? No, probably not. No, uh, <laughs> no. I, I, I would wear a shirt and a hat and a cup for free. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Matt, thanks so much. Yeah, definitely. For taking some time out, uh, we're going to get some lunch because, quite frankly, yeah. uh, you know, we get to see each other probably once a year. Yeah. Uh, the, this, this excuse I have to come to. Um, Southern California and which is kind of gray today. You usually expect LA to be oh, sunny and yesterday. Yesterday was really nice. Got a little it, was, bit. Okay. it was quite cool yesterday, but um, it's not cold. I mean, you know, it's it's not. Yeah. it's not oh, two degrees C, and it, it's yeah. not really cold here normally. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's and when it is, everyone, it's the end of the world. So I lived in Seattle, and I'm I'm used to it. So I love when people complain about the cold times. <laughs> so this is your space in. Deepest, darkest studio land. Yeah, definitely. But you've also got a, a project, haven't you? Yeah, so my uh, my wife's family has um, a bunch of property in eastern Washington, um, near the border of Idaho and Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, in the, it's called the Great Palouse. It's the part of um, the U.S. It's That's the that way a bit. Way here. north, yeah. yeah. And they have offered me to a bunch of space and a lot of room a plot to build a studio. And up there I have some drums and pianos and a few keyboards. Oh, come on, it sounds like you've, you've got quite a lot, say Ludwig kit and, yeah. and grand piano. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. It's, 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 it's pretty much just sit around the old music gear and have some plays. And you know, my wife's classically trained and she learned to play piano up there. That's where she's mm -hmm. from. So we're eventually gonna build a little studio out there. Little, I mean, I hope it's not little, but mm. um, control room, live room situation, and uh, bounce back and, tween, back, back and forth between the two. You know, go up there when I wanna get away from the city and write, and if I have a project I, I need to bring people up for, and Spokane is a major city that's close by, and they've, mm -hmm. got, they've got a few, a couple studios that are really nice if I need to make, have something mixed. So yeah, I, I kind of bounce between the two. Up there is a little bit more, chill there's no neighbors for miles you know 
everyone in my building here is in music. We've mm-hmm. got a music supervisor over there. I've got an EDM guy over here. I've got a singer across the hall. So well, that's kind of kind of cool. If it's you need, cool. If you need... Yeah, and everyone's understanding that you know if you're on the, a the, deadline, the term commune sounds a bit hippie and a bit seventies, but actually yeah. it's quite cool. And that's to probably have... a lot of buildings in LA. There's a lot. Of, I mean, probably for actors and different mm-hmm. different facets of uh, entertainment. But this one in particular is a lot of music people. Maybe it's because. Sony's right there and everyone's mm. dreaming of, you know, getting in there somehow. And, uh, but yeah, no, it's, uh, it's good to have like the, the nature, um, organic studio. Mm. Yeah. And then this just being more of like a writing room with digital stuff. So mm. yeah, I use, I like, I like to use both. So the, and the fact that now you basically whack it on a memory stick or a, yeah. a, a or the, the grab, cloud and grab the laptop and yep. Yeah. Sit, load it on up. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it's a very different world, isn't it, to, to tape-based workflows and having a, yeah. uh, back in the day of having a bike tracks around and tapes Career around. Career. Yeah. Oh, and faxing and, oh, man. Yeah, it's a different yeah. world. I mean, I don't want to age myself because I feel like I'm 15, but uh, I definitely have seen the olden times pre-digital mm. when digital was first starting out. So I, I know the difference between the two. Yeah, definitely. Matt, it's been an absolute pleasure. James, thanks so much. Um, man. We're going to get lunch now. Um, yeah. and there may well be beer, but yeah. hey, it's not it's not Nam yet, so we're allowed. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for yeah, taking some time out. Um, we'll try and get some more of this sort of stuff. I'll try and find some more information about um, ASCAP and get some links yeah. and stuff on on, definitely. on this one. Um, but it's definitely something I want to sort of link back around to, and because it's it's important. Quite frankly, it's how we get paid. It's very important, yeah. And to know it, you, to protect yourself, to know is to be safe. You know, mm. so you don't get lose out on money. You don't you don't lose out on knowing the facts on how royalties work. That's it's just part of a course. You have to learn and study everything you want to get, get money at. So mm. I definitely would look at internet resources, and ASCAP has a lot of resources, and that's pretty much how you learn is by getting your music placed. That's how I learned. I had no knowledge of how it works until I actually got published, so. Until you realized you weren't getting paid. Yeah, and then you have to figure <laughs> out, where is my money? And, you know, being a starving artist is fun, but how long can you, you know? Yeah. yeah. Cool, yeah. Matt, thanks so much. Uh, I've been James yeah. from Production Expert here in downtown Los Angeles. Thanks a lot. <laughs>